This is the DeLong Today Briefing. I am Brad DeLong, an economics professor at the University of California and a sometime Deputy Assistant Secretary of the United States Treasury for Economic Policy. This is the weekly DeLong Today Briefing. Here I hold forth on the Lee Bureau's video platform on my guesses as to what I think you most need to know about what our economy is doing to us right now. I promised Wes Neff, when he agreed to provide the infrastructure for this, that I and my briefings would be lively, interesting, curious, thoughtful, and relatively brief. Relatively. I promised I would provide briefings on a mix of forecasting, politics, macroeconomic analysis, history, and political economy. Today, um, today is entirely a political economy, a moral philosophy, an intellectual history and orientation briefing. And it is also sort of, kind of, a book review. Mike Cogsell of the Roosevelt Institute, you see, has a wonderful new book, Freedom from the Market. What is it about, and why do I love it? Let me start with what may seem to you to be, but is really not a long digression. Let me start with that moment back in 1964, when the Republican Party went all in against African-American hopes for voice, status, and a fairer share of America's immense wealth. The 1964 presidential campaign of Arizona's Barry Goldwater. As he ran for president, Goldwater was dead certain that the Republican Party should make no effort to win African American votes. If you want to go hunting for ducks, Goldwater said, you go where the ducks are. And there were no ducks in even making noises in support of African-American aspirations, Goldwater believed. <clears throat> Goldwater believed that Nixon had lost the election of 1960 because his running mate, Henry Cabot Lodge, um, had predicted that Nixon would name an African-American to the cabinet, coupled with Nixon's, quote, change in the language of the civil rights plank. It changed the sound of that, and they didn't like it. That killed, that, Goldwater said, had curdled Nixon's chances in the South, and Goldwater was not going to make the same mistake. It was in that same election that future Supreme Court Chief Justice William Rehnquist run his, ran, won his spurs by running the Eagle Eye ballot security efforts in Arizona, in which Every black or Mexican-looking person's right to vote was being challenged. Why did Goldwater do this? As a deliberate effort to slow down the voting, to cause people waiting their turn to vote to grow tired and leave. Handbills were distributed warning persons that if they were not properly qualified to vote, they would be prosecuted. And leading that effort never harmed Rehnquist one iota within the late 20th century Republican Party. Rather, it boosted him. Up until 1901, 20 African Americans had been elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Every single one of them had been a Republican. The last of those, George Henry White, left his office representing the 2nd District of North Carolina in 1901. As he left, he said, quote, we Negroes have 32,000 teachers in the schools of the country. We have built, with the aid of our friends, about 20,000 churches and support seven colleges, 17 academies, 50 high schools, five law schools, five medical schools, and 25 theological seminaries. We have done it in the face of lynching, burning at the stake, with the humiliation of Jim Crow laws, the disenfranchisement of our male citizens, slander and degradation of our women, with the factories closed against us, no Negro permitted to be conductor in the railway cars, no Negro permitted to run as engineer on a locomotive, most of the mines closed against us. With all these odds against us, we are forging our way ahead, slowly perhaps, but surely. 
you may use our labor for two and a half centuries, and then taunt us for our poverty. But let me remind you that we will not always remain poor. You may withhold even the knowledge of how to read God's word, and then taunt us for our ignorance. But we would remind you that there is plenty of room at the top, and we are climbing. This, Mr. Chairman, is perhaps the Negro's temporary farewell to the American Congress, but Phoenix-like, he will rise up someday and come again. The next African-American to be elected in 1929 was, again, a Republican. Oscar Stanton de Priest. Not from the South this time, but from the North, from the 1st District of Illinois, the seat now held by Bobby Rush. Congressman de Priest served until 1935, when in the middle of the Great Depression and the New Deal, he was replaced in his district by a Democratic African-American. Arthur W. Mitchell. Um, now, from 1936 to 1944, African-American voter registration, it was split evenly between Democrats and Republicans. From 1948 to 1960, African-American voter registration was split five to three, with the advantage to the Democratic Party. Now, the Democratic edge from 1948 to 1960 was peculiar. Um, in large part, it was Truman's doing, perhaps. <coughs> the post-World War II Democratic parties moved towards civil rights. Um, but the Democratic Party then had all the biggest racists in America, after all. And it gave many of them very powerful positions as committee chairs in the U.S. Congress. You know, the civil rights planks were perhaps beloved of many in the Democratic base, but not of its congressional power structure. And a greater proportion of Republican than Democratic members of Congress were, after all, going to vote for Johnson's Civil Rights Act in 1964. Although, no, not the Voting Rights Act. Harry Truman, Secretary of State Dean Acheson, mused about this apparent contradiction. How is it that, quote, the Southern racist belongs to the same political party as the New York supporter of the Fair Employment Practices Commission? Acheson resolved it by saying that it was the fact that both saw themselves as, both were, getting the short end of the stick in the business-centered civilization of America, and so gravitated toward a political party that did not trust business as much as the Republicans did. I've never been satisfied with that explanation. Um, for the historical commitment of the Republican Party to African American rights and African American uplift, it had real bite. And if it were offset in the 1950s by a superior Democratic commitment to lunch pail issues, to urban organization and mobilization and to patronage, well, the growing number and proportion of African American votes, it was a battleground Republicans should have been eager to contest. But not. Um, why did Goldwater decide to throw away that historical commitment? That founding principle of the Republican Party in pursuit of voters whose deeply racist principles were antithetical to all that the Republican Party had stood for for more than a century. How did this make sense to him and to Rehnquist and to those who made Rehnquist first a justice and then chief justice of the United States Supreme Court, those who still revere Goldwater in some sense? And the answer, I think, is that African-American aspirations um, gotten their face, you know, hopes for an equal voice, and then that, with that equal voice, they could ask and get a redistribution and redefinition of property to redress at least some of past injuries and abuses, um, getting into Republicans' face with those as your aspirations and your plan made Goldwater and company extremely uneasy. Not that Goldwater, personally, and company were more racist 
than the typical American was in 1964. I mean, how could they be? They were overwhelmingly Northerners. Um, they had a long commitment to African-American uplift. But the African-Americans were asking, asking for something we might call real democracy. And real democracy for Rehnquist and Goldwater and their compadres in Arizona's and the nation's Republican Party in 1964 touched very uncomfortably on matters of governance with respect to the market economy, with respect to notions of the just and the fair and the equitable. And so now let me dive back into moral philosophy. And let me turn now to two Vienna-born intellectuals. The Austrian-British Chicagoan right-wing economist Friedrich August von Hayek from 1899 to 1992, and the slightly earlier Austro-Hungarian economist Karl Polanyi, 1886 to 1964. We first give the floor to von Hayek, um, or perhaps the pulpit to von Hayek. For von Hayek teaches the lesson, the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market. Hayek always argued that to inquire whether a market economy's distribution of income and wealth was fair or just was to commit a fatal intellectual blunder. Justice and fairness of any form requires that you receive what you deserve. But a market economy gives not to those who deserve, but rather to those who happen to be in the right place at the right time. Who controls resources that are valuable for future production is not a matter of fairness um, or of what one has done in the past to deserve it. Once you step into the morass of social justice, Hayek believed, you would not be able to stop chasing a just and fair outcome until, quote, the whole of society was organized in all essential respects as the opposite of a free society, unquote. Note that for Hayek, this did not mean you were morally obligated to watch the poor starve and the injured bleed out and die in the street. Society should make, quote, some provision for those threatened by the extremes of indigence or starvation due to circumstances with beyond their control, unquote, if only as the cheapest way to protect the hardworking and successful, quote, against acts of desperation on the part of the needy, unquote. And note that Hayek did not believe much in inherited feudal, guild, and customary blockages to decentralized market exchange. They should be steamed away. But beyond that, you should not interfere with the divine market. The market was or would lead us to utopia, or as close to utopia as humans could attain. And in von Hayek's eyes, interference with the market was, as John Maynard Keynes snarked, not merely inexpedient, but impious. Um, now that a market economy can produce a highly unequal distribution of income and wealth, just as it can produce a less unequal distribution, that was totally beside the point as far as Hayek was concerned. To even raise the question of what, of the, what distribution of wealth should be, that made the presumption, false to Hayek, that people had rights other than property rights and obligations to others in addition to those they freely assumed through contract. Besides, Hayek thought, rectifying inequality was awful because it was chimerical. Hayek believed we lacked and would always lack the knowledge to create a better society. Centralization always led to misinformation and bad decisions. Top-down was a disaster. Only bottom-up spontaneous orders could possibly lead to progress. What humanity had was market capitalism, the only system that could possibly be even moderately efficient and productive, for, quote, prices are an instrument of communication and guidance which embody more information than we directly have, and so the whole idea that you can bring about the same order based on the division of labor by simple direction falls to the ground, unquote. 
Any attempts to reorder the market distribution of income in order to reward the deserving at the expense of the undeserving would erode market capitalism. Quote, the idea that you can arrange for distribution of incomes corresponding to merit or need does not fit your need for prices, including the prices of labor, to direct people to go where they are needed, unquote. And once you start planning, you are on the inevitable road to serfdom. Quote, the detailed scale of values which must guide the planning makes it impossible that it should be determined by anything like democratic means. Hayek's was a this-is-as-good-as-it-is-ever-going-to-get sort of utopianism, but it was a rigid and doctrinaire and theological utopianism even so. Now, um, accepting that this better organizing of society nevertheless cared not a whit for the fair and the just, Hayek understood, was not likely to be done to universal huzzas. That the only rights the market economy recognizes are property rights, and indeed, only those property rights that are valuable, are worth anything, give you any social power, would not inspire the multitudes. The fact that the most valuable property rights are those useful in making things for which the rich have a truly serious Jones, that made matters worse. It was clear that people thought they had other rights beyond those that accrued to the property they happened to hold by the luck of the market and its value. And this feeling posed an enormous problem for Friedrich von Hayek. And thus he identified two substantive and powerful enemies to a good, or at least a good as it was likely to get, society. Egalitarianism and permissiveness. Now in a younger generation of libertarians, Milton Friedman would dismiss Hayek's worries. Friedman was morally certain that most wealth was not and would never be inherited, and that most people were pretty much equal and pretty clever. Provide people with access to education, reward them for what contribution they made to production, and you would have a middle-class society in which it did not matter much that rights accrued to property rather than to people, because the overwhelming bulk of valuable property would be people's labor. Humans' eyes, brains, and hands. Voila! the overwhelming bulk of people would have a not grossly unfair share of the property. And so the market it would work for them. And um, indeed, as long as we train our gaze on white male native-born Americans in and around and before and around the 1970s, the 1960s, or the 1950s, um, their income distribution would, lead, would lend Friedman's belief some credence widen the pool of Americans or look back on the more unequal distribution of 1929 or forward to that of today, and the sense of his position dissolves. Um, Milton Friedman could be comfortable with democracy, market capitalism, and a version of Hayekian libertarianism. But for the less Pollyannish Hayek, however, Democracy was itself a grave danger. First, because the relatively equal income distribution was not guaranteed. Second, because if one counts for one in the polity, that teaches egalitarianism. That society should treat me as well as it treats you, even though you have the property and thus the right to the market economy's concern and solicitude, and I do not. Egalitarianism is, Hayek wrote, a product of the necessity under unlimited democracy to solicit support from even the worst. Poisonous to Hayek was democracy in Alexis de Tocqueville's sense that made mere luck, made the one the master and the other valet, and luck might change tomorrow. It is, warned Hayek, not by conceding a right to equal concern and respect to those who break the code that civilization is maintained. And what is the code? Respect. Respect for property, respect for order, respect for hierarchies, both because hierarchies outside the economy were good and because eroding hierarchies outside the economy would also erode confidence in the hierarchy of property. 
and the fearsome result would be permissiveness, which Hayek wrote, quote, assisted by a scientistic psychology, has come to the support of those who claim a share in the, a share in the wealth of our society without submitting to the discipline to which it was due, unquote. The lesson to learn was clear. A prosperous market economy could only flourish if it were protected from the tides of democracy and permissiveness. Perhaps, um, indeed, I think von Hayek thought probably societies would periodically need a Spartan Lycorgos, a Chilean general Augusto Pinochet. They would need someone to seize power and reorder society in an authoritarian mode that would respect property and the market economy. That the spilling of more than ink would be necessary to enforce such a reordering was a regrettable consequence of this tarnished utopia that was the best attainable, and was really the fault of those social justice warriors who argued that we could have something better, that we should raise our sights. Um, Hayek, you know, standing on the shoulder of giants and tyrants alike, thus articulated a position about the market economy that generated a very strong willingness on the political right to view democracy, especially when democracy inquires about the order of property and wealth, not even as a lesser good, but as a genuine evil. And Hayek serves as a marker for a very powerful current and thought and action. Um, he's not just an isolated loon shouting at clouds. His thoughts are powerful, not least because they found themselves congenial to and backed by very rich and powerful people. And indeed, um, he is not altogether wrong. It is very true that the democratic political sphere can turn into one in which the logic is not cooperation and growth, but rather confiscation and redistribution to the deserving, or even one of friends and enemies in which the logic is punishment for the undeserving. Hayek is not altogether wrong that keeping your head down, concentrating on win-win production for market exchange, and ignoring appeals to social justice, which involve not just treating equals equally, but treating unequals unequally, that humans have not historically been very good at treating all others as of equal significance. Ignoring appeals to social justice as chimerical, there are situations in which it can be better. And Hayek was a far-sighted genius in one aspect. He did deserve his Nobel Prize. He did grasp most thoroughly and profoundly what the market economy could do for human benefit. All societies in solving their economic problem face profound difficulties of getting reliable information to the deciders and then incentivizing the deciders to act for the public good. The market order of property, contract, and exchange can if property rights can be arranged so that they are so carved at the joints that those principally affected by an action are all at the table, um, the market order can push decision-making out to the decentralized periphery where the reliable information is, thus solving the information problem. And by rewarding those who bring resources to the most valuable uses, automatically solves the incentivization problem. Now, there remains the distribution problem. Who was all this great stuff created going to go to? And many of Hayek's thinking come from his inability to recognize the nature of that problem at all. Um, but, you know, absolutely nailing two out of three ain't bad. Um, plus, there's the macro coordination problem, um, where Hayek is equally much, um, where is equally much a complete howler. Now, on the other side, um, on the other side, there is Karl Polanyi, who teaches the lesson, the market is made for man, not man for the market. Friedrich von Hayek loved the fact that the market turned everything into a commodity um, and feared those who thought it a fundamental strike against the market 
that it did not make it everyone fundamentally materially equal. Carl Polanyi, um, Carl Polanyi disagreed emphatically. Carl Polanyi believed that land, labor, and finance, things the market treated in economies, were not real commodities, but rather fictitious commodities. They could not be governed by the logic of profit and loss, but they needed to be embedded in society and managed by the community, taking into account religious and moral dimensions. The result, Polanyi wrote, was a tension, a contest, a double movement. Ideologues of the market and the market itself attempted to disembed land, labor, and finance from society's moral and religious governance. In reaction, society struck back by trying to restrict the domain of the market and putting its thumb on the scales where market outcomes seemed unfair. As a result, a market society will face a backlash. It can be a left-wing backlash, it can be a right-wing backlash, it can be a democratic backlash, it can be an authoritarian backlash, it can be an anarchist backlash, it can be a tyrannical backlash, but there will be a backlash and it will be powerful. Now these are, were brilliant insights, but as expressed by Polanyi in his original, they are also sadly incomprehensible to an overwhelming proportion of those who try to read him. Um, let me see if I can sum up Polanyi better. The market economy. It believes that the only rights that matter are property rights, that the only property rights that matter are those that produce things for which the rich have effective demand, and that you dare not monkey with whatever distribution of wealth the market has produced. Um, the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market. But people believe they have other rights. With respect to land, people believe they have rights to a stable community. This includes the belief that the natural and built environment in which they grew up or that they made with their hands, it's theirs, whether or not the market logic says it would be more profitable if it were different. Say, if a highway ran through it, or more lucrative if somebody else lived there. With respect to labor, people believe they have rights to a suitable income. After all, they prepared for their profession, they played by the rules, and so society owes them a fair income, something commensurate with their preparation. And this holds whether or not the logic of the world market says otherwise. With respect to finance, people believe that as long as they do their job of working diligently, the flow of purchasing power through the economy should be such as to give them the wherewithal to buy. And rootless cosmopolite financiers, who may be thousands of miles away, should have no commensurate right to decide that this or that flow of purchasing power through the economy is no longer sufficiently profitable and so be, should be shut off. They should not be able to make your job dry up and blow away. People have not just property rights, Polanyi declared, but these other economic rights which a pure market economy will not respect. It will lay down that highway. It will ignore years of preparation when doling out income. It will allow your purchasing power to dry up and blow away along with your job. And society will intervene and will re-embed the economy in its moral and religious logic so that these rights are satisfied. Now these rights that society will attempt to validate do not um, or might not be rights to anything like an equal distribution. And it is probably wrong to describe them as fair. Um, they are what people expect, given a certain social order. Equals should be treated equally, yes, but unequals should be treated unequally. And, as I said before, societies do not have to, and almost never do, presume that people are of equal significance, and now we come round to Mike Conksell and his excellent new book. He takes a very Polanyian line in it, looking back on American economic and political history, on how our freedom ought to be much more than freedom to buy or sell, limited by the wealth and income that history and the market give us. The things we need to lead our lives are forced into markets, he says, 
where we are compelled to obtain them at the mercy of private profit-seeking actors and our ability to pay. And that is not freedom, but is instead a form of compulsion. Coxell writes, quote, When citizens declare that health care is a human right, they are making a stand against market dependency. In this view, there are still markets. Doctors and nurses get salaries, MRI machines and bandages are purchased, and so on. But it also holds that individuals should not be dependent on the market as the sole determinant of what care they get. Health care should go to those who are sick, not those who are sick and also happen to have the money, unquote. It's not a cry against markets, it's a cry against a market that commands you. Consul wants to reach into the past for an American understanding that market dependency can be a source of unfreedom, both when wealth is unequally and unfairly distributed and when individual market actors have too much market power and can charge unfair prices. All the market will bear is not a general principle. The rhetoric of the market is about how it is all voluntary exchange and voluntary exchange with people agree to, and how can that be unfair? Um, but none other than Adam Smith had an answer with a piece of rhetorical judo in his Wealth of Nations. Suppose the market produced an equilibrium in which the great majority of the people were desperately poor and in want. What would we think of that? Adam Smith's answer, quote, What improves the circumstances of the greater part can never be regarded as an inconvenience to the whole. No society can surely be flourishing and happy, of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. It is but equity, besides, that they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves tolerably well-fed, clothed, and lodged. Focus on that, it is but equity, besides. Fair, that is, a voluntary exchange, Smith says, can be unfair and inequitable. It can lead to an overall outcome that nobody would voluntarily accept under any definition of voluntary that excludes being under severe compulsion. Smith has been ambling along throughout the book, pointing out the extraordinary benefits of the market economy and how it is an arena of freedom because people choose to undertake acts of economic exchange which are in accord with equity as each trades what he or she values less for what he or she values more. And then Smith brings people up short with this package that I quoted. Coxell says that America has always agreed with Smith, and that it is only today that glib libertarians purveying fantasies are trying to make us forget, quote, that free programs and keeping things free from the market are as American as apple pie. One of the best passages in the book is where he notes the connection between the fight for a $15 minimum wage and human freedom. Quote, Service sector workers demanding a $15 minimum wage and a union have already won huge victories with ideas about how low-wage, precarious work is a form of unfreedom. The Reverend William Barber noted that, quote, it took 400 years from slavery to now to get from zero to 7.25 an hour, we can't wait another 400 years to get to 15. And as Henry Farrell says in his review of Mike Consul, he turns the Hayekian system of thought against itself. Quote, Hayek's notion of spontaneous order is supposed to be evolutionary, to provide a more supple response to what people want. But if there is a need to provide collective goods for people that cannot be fulfilled through voluntarism, the Hayekian logic then becomes a brutal constraint on adaptation. Ultimately, if all you can say in response to the ills of society is, the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market, you have very little to say indeed. Consul quotes Oliver Wendell Holmes's fear and alarm that his fellow justices on the Lochner Supreme Court were, in their, quote, willingness to use a very specific understanding of economics to override law, writing a preferential understanding of economics into the Constitution itself, in a fundamentally illegitimate and societally disruptive way. Because, after all, the market is made for man, and not man for the market. Get Mike Consul's book, Freedom from the Market. Read it. It is very, very much worthwhile for you. 
I am Brad DeLong. This, this is the DeLong Today Briefing. And let me thank you very, very much for watching me.